You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing today? Well, the situation is somewhat critical here. We're approaching half term in a few weeks' time, and my son has decided that he and I are going to have a race. This all stemmed from the fact that I was going on about how he can't do longer distances, he can only do short runs. I wasn't saying that I actually am any good, but that I I do five mile runs, that's what I do. Runs, that's a strong word to use, movement. Anyway, it ended up with this, well, there was this debate. And so now there is going to be this race in half term where we both race the five miles and see who does it first. Initially, I was thinking this is fine because he can only do, he's good at 100 metres, very speedy, but five miles, you know, he just won't be able to do it. But then he's decided his cunning plan is to run 100 metres, walk 100 metres, run 100 metres. I tried to run much faster today and ended up running slower. I'm really, I have to win this. I have to show him that I am right (laughs) somehow. And I just know it's going to end very badly. So if in a few weeks time, an episode of this podcast is broadcast from, I don't know, a physio or an orthopaedic hospital, it's, you will know things have not gone well. Listeners, I know it's bad of me, but I really have to beat him at this. I really do. And, and let's just face it, I'm not going to. Unless someone could be there with a car. I mean, I know that's cheating and I won't do it, but I can smile at the thought of that. Anyway, there we go. Enough about me. What books have we got this week? We've got some stunners. Most of them are stunners. We have got some great books. We have got The Armour of Light by Ken Follett and Ken is coming on to talk to us about that book. We've got The Stargazers by Harriet Evans and Harriet is going to come on and talk to us about this book. We've got A Spoonful of Murder by J.M. Hall. We've got the the fifth edition in the Spy Family series. And we've got Shatter Me by Tahara Mafi, and I listened to that on audiobook. So let's get stuck in straight away. And the first book, The Armour of Light by Ken Follett. Let me read you the blurb of this book. Kingsbridge, 1792. Revolution is in the air. A tyrannical government is determined to make England a mighty commercial empire. In France, Napoleon Bonaparte begins his rise to power, and with dissent rife, France's neighbours are on high alert. Kingsbridge is on the edge. Unprecedented industrial change sweeps the land, making the lives of the workers in Kingbridge's prosperous cloth mills a misery. Rampant modernisation and dangerous new machinery are rendering jobs obsolete and tearing families apart. Tyranny is on the horizon. Now, as international conflict nears, a story of a small group of Kingsbridge people, including Spinner, Sal Clitheroe, Weaver, David Shoveler and Kit, Sal's inventive and headstrong son, will come to define the struggle of a generation as they seek enlightenment and fight for a future free from oppression. So this is the fifth novel in the Kingsbridge series, which I have loved. And I would say, yes, you could read them all in order, but you can just dive straight into the armour of light. It has so much in it. It really does. But enough of my waffle. Let's go and talk to Ken now. It is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Ken Follett, whose latest truly magnificent book is The Armour of Light. Ken, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here. I remember reading the first book in this series when I, on my first day at university, when I was sobbing into my bed. Your words brought solace. So it's lovely to talk to you today. How nice. Let's start. Can you give us a bit of a summary of this book? But it's set in Kingsbridge, which is the fictional town in which I've set several other novels, including The Pillars of the Earth. Uh, This one is set in the 18th century. So it's about the Industrial Revolution, which caused tremendous strife, but also gave great opportunities to some people. And at the same time, there was a terrible war in Europe. All the European countries ganged up on France because they were 
terrified by the French Revolution. They all thought the guillotine was coming for them. And that what the, the French turned out to be a lot more difficult to, to defeat than anybody thought, and it took 23 years. So, so all the industrial problems, the new machines coming in and putting people out of work, all of that went on, and, it, and all the consequences were made much worse by this war, and people were, were sent to, into the army against their will and so on, and taxes went up to pay for the war, the price of bread doubled, and uh, when, when the women couldn't afford to buy bread to feed their families, they broke into the baker's shops and stole the bread, and that was, called, that was known as the Revolt of the Housewives in the 1790s. So the story is about how the people of Kingsbridge, in particular half a dozen characters that we're interested in, how they lived through this, this the, the conflicts and the rows and the love affairs and the scandals and so on that go on for um, about 35 years. And I, it always amazes me how you take a moment in history, but it's wrapping the people around it, the characters. Oh, okay. it, 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 is there ever a pull as to what you focus on or does it just come naturally as you're writing? No, I've, oh, I always focus on the characters um, because we, you know, the, the history is the background and we see it through the lives of these characters we see there's a war on but we see that because it affects their lives it affects them it, it makes them struggle to keep body and soul together and and the and the technical revolution puts some people out of work and gives some people new opportunities for work and so we see everything it, it's a novel so you see everything through the eyes of the characters and they're the ones we're interested in but the the troubles they have and the struggles they have come from the historical background, the Industrial Revolution. And it's a book that, yes, it's the fifth in the series, but you don't have to have read each of the books to just jump into this one, I would say. you can. No, I think the Kingsbridge books you can read in any order, I think, because they're, they're, there's never a character from one book who reappears in another because the, the time between the books is much too long. So um, it doesn't really matter. And I didn't write them in chronological order either. The Pillars of the Earth is set in the 12th century, but the evening and the morning, which came much later, is set in the in the, the 11th century. So, But it doesn't matter because they're, they're completely independent stories. And I think it's actually think it's quite fun to jump to and fro and see how the town developed later and then look at how it was a hundred years earlier. So if you find out about a moment in history, is that what sort of sparks your interest in writing another book based in this area? Is that what sort of drives yeah. you to the next story? Yes, that's exactly right. Every book starts with me reading something or, or, or talking to somebody or seeing something on TV and thinking to myself, I wonder if I could write a story about that. That's always the beginning. So it doesn't really, I don't think, oh, it's about time I wrote about the 17th century. I think, I think, oh, the Industrial Revolution. Wow, that's got a lot of potential, especially with the war, the Napoleonic Wars, and the Battle of Waterloo at the end of it. Yeah, I, I think, yes, I think that could work, and I start working on it. Are there times that you get an idea for the for the story or a moment in history that actually doesn't then become a book? Yeah, it has happened. It happens less as I go on because I get better at just making the decision. <laughs> but certainly in the past, I've often I've often worked on something for maybe a month and then realised it wasn't going anywhere. That, that that used to happen to me quite a lot doesn't happen to me quite so much now, which is nice because it's really a bit annoying <laughs> to work on something for a month and have to throw it away. But there must be a huge amount of research that you do to sort of lay the foundations on which you build the story. Is that, again, something that is just part of you and researching times in history, or is that a part of the writing process? I think um, most authors enjoy the research because it is much easier than writing the book, and it's it's fun. You You meet people and interview them and and uh, I spent, uh, I've, because this whole 
the whole industrial revolution was started by machines, new machines. And I felt I had to know how those machines worked and what they would what they did. So one of the things I did in the research was go to various museums in in this country, in the in the south of England and in the and in, in near Manchester. And and look at the machines, and in some of these museums, you, you can actually get them working. And really, so for example, the spinning jenny, which was one of the most important machines ever invented, for a long time, I was I was reading about it, and I was looking at pictures, and I was I was surfing the internet, and I still wasn't quite getting exactly what it did. But once I could actually see one and watch it working, and even work it myself, then it became clear. And it has to be clear to me if it's going to be clear to the reader. Yeah, I, I, I don't give the readers a lot of technical detail, but I give them enough to understand what we're talking about. Because I think that's important, because, of course, many of the characters in the Armour of Light are working with these machines all day. and And obviously, they understand them. And if I'm going to say what it's like to be a mill hand in the Industrial Revolution, I really have to understand the machines that they're working. So when you're writing, are you seeing the action in front of you as if it was a film? Oh, yeah, I, I certainly do. And, I, and most readers feel that. Most readers feel as if they've watched it happening because what, I think what we do when we read, quite often, when we read fiction especially, is that we actually make a movie in our head. And that's why when one of these stories is cast as a television series or a movie, I I look at the actor and I think, no, no, he doesn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that doesn't matter because every reader has got a different picture of what this person looks like. And if it's a good actor, it takes the actor about 30 seconds to convince you you know, that he or she is that cat. And then you can't remember what your original picture was. You just see the actor now. So it doesn't really matter, but I think it's quite funny. And I do, it's also part of what the author really has to do is help the reader make that picture. So you have to describe things vividly enough and clearly enough so that if, if the person goes into, let's say, a Methodist hall, then the reader's got to see it and there's got to be enough in the on the page it might only be a paragraph but there's got to be enough about the color of the walls and what the furniture is and how big the windows are just enough to enable the reader to start making that movie and i don't know about you ken but i find when i'm reading a book and it doesn't grab me it's either my fault that i haven't immerse myself in the words enough or that there isn't enough building of that scene so that the movie can start in my mind. I work on the assumption that it's never the reader's fault. If if a reader has has if a reader's attention has wandered while reading one of my books, I've really made a bad mistake. <laughs> and I quite I like showing my work to people before it's printed. Because I want them to say, if I want them to say things like chapter 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 three got a bit boring, they might say. And if if they've told me that, I can fix it. And that's really quite important to me. I take a lot of advice. And in fact, if an editor says to me, Ken, the book is wonderful and you're a genius, I say, I say, look, that's not what I need from you. I don't want flattery from an editor. An editor is supposed to help the writer write a better book. And I say, and I want you to tell me the bits that you didn't much like or or didn't agree with or when such character did something that you didn't think that. I have quite a lot of people who read my drafts and, and they know that they're not supposed to tell me I'm wonderful. They're supposed to tell me where I've gone wrong. Yes, you want them there to be the truth tellers to end up with the book that is a, as riveting as... The Armour of Light is. Exactly. That's exactly it, yes. I think it's a good time for me to ask you to read a little bit from the book, and, and it really is going to be a little bit. You're going to read us the first two sentences, I think, Ken. Yes, here we go. Until that day, 
Sal Clitheroe had never heard her husband scream. After that day, she never heard it again, except in dreams. And if two sentences don't grab you, I don't know what's going on because though that's just it just makes you want to read more and find out what, what's happening. Do the characters ever haunt you after you finished writing a book? Not really, no. I I start with the story and then as the story develops, I begin to think of the characters that will do this kind of thing. And if and I do I do feel emotion as I'm writing. I, I think I feel the kind of emotions that I hope the reader will feel. So, so if, there's, if one of the characters is being treated unjustly, being bullied or something, I feel, I, I feel this, this, this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and, of course, that's what I want the reader to feel. And sometimes if it's a sad moment, I have a tear in my eye. Um, so, I, it, so I'm not cold-blooded about it. But when the book is over, I start again immediately on another book. You know, once once it's finally gone, I don't like to. I don't like to. I, I I sometimes say I would take a fortnight off and not do, not do anything to do with my next book. But after after about ten days, I'm I'm thinking about it. It's too exciting writing story. These stories is too exciting for me to just stop doing it for no reason. So I start on the next book very quickly and my mind becomes starts to fill up with the characters in the new story. But if you could go back to when you were writing your very first book and just whisper something in your ear, what what would you whisper to yourself? I think I would say to myself, my young self, exactly what I say to young writers who ask me, what is the what is the key what's the magic formula they say it's not a magic formula but there is something uh, and that is that the reader must feel the emotions of the characters in the story the reader when they're scared the reader must be scared when they're sad the reader must have a tear in his eye uh, and when something when something spooky is happening I like to think that the reader might get up and go and make sure that he did actually lock the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the light on. And so that's so that so that's I think that if if you can do that, if you've got the reader sharing the emotions of the characters, then you've probably got a bestseller. And if you haven't, if you can't do that, then you you certainly can't write a popular novel. I mean, there are other kind. There are many kinds of novel, of course. There are funny novels, there are hilarious novels, and there are satirical novels, and so on. And novels aren't all the same, but popular for popular novels, it's really about the reader feeling those emotions as she or he reads. So as a writer, which is the hardest word to write, the first one or the last one? Oh, I think endings are quite difficult. The first one's not so difficult because... I spend a long time planning and researching the book. So by the time I write chapter one, I know what's going to happen. And then it's just a question of of sharing the drama with the reader, making sure that that right from the start, the reader is thinking, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? <laughs> so that's the first. And that it, it's very, very important, but it's not really difficult. Endings I find a bit more difficult because... They are sentimental, aren't they? I mean, the lovers have got together and the bad guy has been vanquished. And in the case of the armour of light, a, a particularly repressive law against trade, trade unions has been overturned. And so it's, it's, it's all happy, happy. And you've got to make sure that doesn't go too far because... Readers are, readers are quite smart people, and they, they, they're not fooled by anything. They actually know that life doesn't always have happy endings. And so I think you've got to be, I find it, I find I've got to be careful to give the reader the satisfaction of problems solved without overdoing it. That balance. Can we come to the final question, which is the most crucial one on this podcast? So please prepare yourself for it. Oh my, oh my goodness. <laughs> and the question is this, 
What biscuit was powering the writing of the Armour of Light? What was your biscuit of choice? Now, I've got to tell you that I don't eat biscuits. Oh, Ken, we were getting along so well up till now. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I noticed that a lot of men of my age were getting type 2 diabetes and were told by the doctor that it was to do with a high sugar diet. And I always, all my life, I have had a sweet tooth. I didn't, I didn't have a chocolate. I ate the box of chocolates. <laughs> and, and I realized, and the other thing that slightly scared me, because is the doctor always tells them not to drink alcohol. And I'm quite fond of wine. And so I thought, I don't want to get this illness. And I'm just going to stop eating sugary things altogether. And I have, and I don't, and it's, it's easy now. I don't. I don't want dessert. I don't want a chocolate, and I, I'm afraid I don't eat biscuits. Gosh. So, uh, is there any food, healthy or otherwise, that that does power your writing? What when you've been no, writing? I, all no, time? I don't. I don't do anything like that. I used to smoke, and of course, when I became a full time writer, every time I stopped to think, I'd light a cigarette, and I was smoking so many cigarettes. And for a few years, I rationed myself. I would have one cigarette an hour on the hour while I was writing. <laughs> <laughs> but then if, in my 30s, I was about 33, I think, I quit altogether. So I, don't, so I don't have the fags and I don't have the biscuits. Nothing really like that. I mean, and, oh, and it doesn't bother me. A lot of people listen to music while they're writing. But I don't. I love music, but I find if I play a CD, an hour later I realise it's come to the end and I haven't heard any of it because I'm, I'm, I'm not in this world. I'm in that world, the imaginary world, and what's going on around me doesn't really impact on me. So, so I don't have any of those kind of habits, really. We're very glad that you do immerse yourself in these worlds because it's just a joy to read your books, uh, particularly the most recent one, The Armour of Light. Ken Follett, thank you so much. A pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. So now let's get straight into The Stargazers by Harriet Evans. My goodness, what a book. Let me read you the blurb of this one. It's the 1970s and Sarah has spent a lifetime trying to bury memories of her childhood, the constant fear, the horror of her school days and fame, the vast crumbling house that was the sole obsession of her mother, Iris, a woman as beautiful as she was cruel. Sarah's solace has been her cello and the music that allowed her to dream, transporting her from the bleakness of those early years to her new life with her husband Daniel in their safe if slightly chaotic, Hampstead home, and with a concert career that has brought her fame and restored a sense of self. The past, though, has a habit of creeping into the present, and as long as Sarah tries to escape, it seems the pull of her mother, Fane Hall, and the secrets hidden there cannot be suppressed, threatening to unravel the fragile happiness she enjoys now. Sarah will need to travel back to Fane to confront her childhood and search for the true meaning of home. Gosh, I love Harriet's writing. I really do. And this book is just another superb one. And let's go and talk to Harriet now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Harriet Evans, who has written The Stargazers. Harriet, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. Talk about this wonderful book. Can we start with the really obvious question? Can you summarise this book for us? Well, the Stargazers is about the idea of looking up and looking to the future and trying to pull a good life for yourself out of the remains of a not great childhood or great situation. And it follows the story of Sarah, who when we meet her is moving into a house in Hampstead with her husband and they're both a bit chaotic. She's a cellist and he is a sort of writer and comedian. It's the late 60s, early 70s. And they get married and they settle down and they have a kid and they're doing up the house. And you start to see more and more that Sarah is not able to cope with family life, that she's not able to cope with 
being a mother, being a normal person who lives on a street and has a normal life. And we get taken back to the past in part two to her childhood, which is um, her growing up in this crumbling stately hall home called Fane Hall, which is somewhere in Sussex. And we meet her mother and her sister and we start to realise just how extraordinary and terrible her childhood was. And her mother, who is a, a true villain who I very much enjoyed writing, called Iris, who thinks she should have inherited this beautiful ruin of Fane. And it's about whether Sarah is going to be able to recover any of that and have a life for herself and make happiness for herself. Fantastic. And I'm interested, when you start writing a book like this, what's the sort of first concept? Is it there are particular themes that you want to address or there are characters that come to mind or a, or a setting? What What's the trigger? Yeah, it's all of those. But what I'm looking for, and it's my job, so I have to box up creativity. I have a contract to write books, so I am always looking for a new idea. And one of the things that's interesting about being a writer is how you people... Th- People are always sort of in awe of creativity. And actually, if it's your job, you have to find a way to draw it out. You know, you are actually pulling those ideas out of your head. And I'm always looking for an image. And sometimes the image presents itself to me. And sometimes I get it wrong. And I think it's what the book's going to be about. And this has two images. It's one, Sarah and Daniel, her husband, arriving in Hampstead on this bright autumn day, a bit like today, driving over the cobbles to this lovely street in Hampstead where there's lots of, you know, bohemian people. I'm slightly stretching it that they could have afforded a house there. It's a really, really nice road. I've been there. It was like a house went for sale there for like 10 million last year. I was like, there's no way they able to live. But I'm a writer. I can do what I want. <laughs> and I could see them and that sort of hopefulness of when you arrive at a new house. But it also, I thought it would just be a story about that, about them and them raising their family. And it became more obvious to me as I was writing that this was a story about the past. I always want to write about the past and about houses. And I realised that her mother sort of kept popping up as I was writing. And I really can't stand it when authors talk about their characters as if they're real, but they are real to me as I'm writing. And I realised that this was a story about Sarah's childhood. And I took my daughters, we live in Bath, um, on the first day of the summer holidays, 18 months ago, two years ago, I took them to Longleat for the day, which is, you know, beautiful stately home with the lions and everything. And we were driving down the long, long drive, having had a very traumatic situation with the monkeys who'd pulled off our wing mirror because they saw it was fixed on with gaffer tape and we were the people who had to pull over with the indicator lights and the monkey express my ambulance had to come and fix our car (laughs) this is so embarrassing anyway we're driving down the long driveway afterwards and this house appeared i've been there loads of times before but i just suddenly thought oh my gosh yes and i could see her driving down the driveway with this awful mother it's like 1955 and her sister they're about 11 12 And the house looks a bit like that, but it doesn't because it's cracked and crumbling and there's ivy growing up it and all the windows are either smashed or boarded up or have rags stuck in them. And I could feel this horrible sense of foreboding. I was like, that is where she's come from and I have to write about that. And and part of your job as a writer is to be looking for those moments and then to get them down on paper, to not overanalyze it too much, but to get it down. Because once you get it down... Ah, that's when you start to work out the story. But that's also when you can go back and change the story. You can rewrite it. But but it's got to be powerful to entice me into wanting to live in that world. So when you're driving along after a quite a traumatic experience, sounds like something I go through. Yeah. uh, And you get this this sort of vision, does that signify to you this is a book? Or do you get those visions and, and you have to add more flesh onto them? to become a book you like if you are a working mum and lots of people but for me I'm thinking about 20 things all at the same time anyway I'm thinking that would be a bit a good paint color for the kitchen <laughs> I, I like Philippa's hoodie I should get one for my gym class <laughs> I, I I'm always holding ideas in my head and some of them stay and some of them don't And when they're really, it's quite useful because if they're really powerful ones, it's not like a religious vision where you sink to the floor and you're like, hey, but I will, I have a notes, you know, I have notes app. So I will just sometimes make a note. But quite often with something like that, I was like, yeah, yeah, I can see this. I can see that. 
And I'd already started writing it, but I was like, that is the solution to the problem I've got, which is this book isn't working out the way I'd wanted it to, and I need to change it. And one of the great things about having written 12, 13 books is you, and this is the the thing I want aspiring writers to most take away whenever I'm doing talks about creative writing or whatever, it is as important to go wrong as it is to go right. Because if the book isn't working out, that just means you're working out the story. You've got to write some bits that don't work before you understand what the story is. So if it feels like it's flat or you know that that story isn't working out or that you're stretching too hard, that's a good sign. That means you're going wrong and you'll work it out and then you'll go right later, if that makes sense. Oh, that's very good. Wise words from Harriet Evans, people. <laughs> no, that's that's so interesting because... Often when you've written something and you just think, well, that doesn't work, you're inclined to just disbelieve in yourself, whereas actually it's part of the process. Totally, totally. And I was an editor before, so you know, I know how important editing is. I do absolutely loads of work to my books, so I know that if you're a scriptwriter for film or TV, there's no way you just deliver it and people say that's fine. You know, it's picked over by a committee of... 10 people sometimes you're doing multiple multiple rewrites and publishing I think we sometimes let writers off a bit too easily you know I read books quite often where I think that book should have been just should have gone through two three more edits you know Mm -hmm. not naming any names (laughs) (laughs) I'm interested though if you've been an editor as well when you get your edit back how do you take those because if you've edited yours within an inch of its life I don't know. If it was me, I I would be a bit miffed with any edit. No, because I hand it in knowing I've gone as far as I can go. So I need someone else to look at it. So I never hand it in going, "Um, this is my book. (laughs) And I hand it in going, this is not the first draft because I wouldn't hand in a first draft. But this is as far as I can go. And I want you to read this and tell me what isn't working and I will fix it. And I love fixing it. I have an offcuts file for the Stargazers, but I have it for most books. I have an offcuts file for the Stargazers, which is 70,000 words long. I mean, that like that's that much of a book. Wow. So I will take bits out quite happily. I will r- revise bits quite happily. And I don't ever... So I'm the opposite, actually. And I think quite a lot of editors, there are loads of editors who've been, and authors who've been editors or worked in publishing, um, I think quite often they are good authors because they know just how important the process is. You know, I, mm-hmm. I don't mind it. I mean, you get it and you're like, oh, God, how do I get into this? Like, how do I work this out? But again, you have to let that uncertainty sit with you. It's really important to let uncertainty sit with you and not panic because there's not a binary way out of it, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. My goodness. It seems like a really good point for me to ask you if you would mind reading us a little bit from the book. Thank you. I'm going to read the first few paragraphs, which when I say that, they're very short paragraphs. But this is literally the first page of the book. It is very short and um, it's simply headed Iris. And that is the name of Sarah's mother. During those last days, before she becomes too weak, she finds she remembers it all once more, piercingly clearly, as if to die, she has to live through it again. So much of it is pain, the pain that has burnt within her since she was very little. So she writes it down, though her hands are slow and stupid, the letters childlike, and the doltish nurse looking after her keeps interrupting to ask if she wants a drink or her hand held. Leave me alone, you fool, she wants to shout, but her voice has stopped working, so she smiles instead, and they think she is wonderful. Isn't she wonderful, Carol says, sobbing over her. They all think she's wonderful. She writes it down. Why? So they'll understand. So they will know the truth. She does not know why she writes it down, but she remembers everything. And I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about Iris's daughter, Sarah. We don't want any spoilers, but can you just give us more of a feel for her as we approach the book? So when you meet Sarah, she's a young married woman 
and she's a cellist, professional cellist. And you'd think she sort of um, has quite a lot to look forward to. And because she's had this really odd childhood and been hugely neglected and her mother's just dreadful, but also is sort of a product of the age in a way as well, that she's sort of sent off to boarding school as well as everything else. And it's this really dreadful boarding school. I enjoyed writing that too, because lots I had quite a lot of fun writing that, lots of really ghastly girls and sort of... Um, but also friendship and fun times and things. I really wanted Sarah to come across as someone you like, even though bad things happen to her. So she's quite sort of affected by her early years and not being mothered. She hasn't really, her father's dead and she hasn't been mothered or parented by Iris at all. Um, she has a very prickly relationship with her sister, Victoria, Vic. And I enjoyed writing that too, because I like, exploring relationships when it's not one way or the other it's really boring when a villain is just a villain villains aren't just villains you know um it, it's more interesting to consider why someone has done something in a book rather than just say they're bad they're bad and and I find that's true quite often in real life you know there are two sides to every argument I mean some people are evil but it, it, Iris is evil but it's interesting to examine why she's evil was she born like that were there things that happened to her that changed her or did she become like that? And it's like in Wuthering Heights when um, Heathcliff grabs Hurt and Earnshaw and he says, let's see if the same wind that twisted me doesn't twist you. You know, like, will I make you a bad person? Mm -hmm. uh, will I be able to influence you into becoming this kind of obsessed, you know? And I really, one of the last things I did to the book when I was rewriting it is go through and make Sarah sort of quite funny and sarcastic because I wanted you to feel like she's someone you know and like in real life and not just be someone who terrible things happen to all the time because when she has a baby she finds it really hard I mean I found having a baby extremely surprising and quite hard um and I wanted to examine that as well just because I don't think it gets talked about in literature either. Everything to do with books about women either gets parceled up and made into a genre like chiclet or yummy mummy or older reading group fiction no one ever says like here is what happens to a vast majority of half of the population how did you find it or let's write about this story about this person you know it's part of their life um so it's really important to me she was relatable but also that she was a, a definite person who you felt you knew she wasn't just the sum of the experiences that's happened to her if that makes sense and are you one of these authors whose characters linger in your mind afterwards and you find yourself having conversations or thinking about about them? Or are you one of the authors where when the book is done, the characters are done? Um, it's not the characters so much as the world where you leave them. And it's quite often not the main character. It will be um, some people who you find help them or you you become especially fond of them. But with the Stargazers especially, I did really, really love Sarah and Daniel. And you see them at the end, at the end of the pandemic, and they're still there and they have children. And I thought a lot about, they were originally, it was going to be a trilogy um, about them in their house over 50 years or so. And then it just changed. That wasn't their story. Um, but I did, so I did do a lot of thinking about them. Um, but sometimes I find it really hard to leave the world behind. And with this, I was happy to leave them behind. I felt their story had come to an end. My last novel but one, The Garden of Lost and Found, when I finished that, and it ends at quite a crucial moment, but it, it's a point in the story that explains what's happened before, so it is the right ending, I, I could barely bear to send it off to the editor. And I'm not, I'm, I tried to be businesslike, but I was just like, I love these people. I love this house. I love this, these characters. I was crying um, because I just didn't want to leave that world. But other than that, I don't ever think, um, oh, you know, it's, it's something you switch on um, because it's your job. Um but what I'm always trying to get right is the world I'm writing about. So if I'm writing something set in the 50s and I'm watching like the new book, I am actually writing a trilogy now. 
And that will be about an American, the mother is American and grows up in the 50s and 60s. So if I'm watching Mad Men, I'll be writing down little notes. Or if I was in New York last week, everything was, you know, was useful or helpful. But it's about half treating it as a job and half going through your life, like I say, and being open to it. So when you go to Longleat with the children, you, you've you left that part of your brain open that you can let it in. It's a strange... I always think of writing a book as like flat pack boxes that if you don't put them down with gaffer tape, but if you seal them, you know, with the flaps all going in, you arrange the flaps. If you try and put them all down together at the same time, they won't go. Or, or if you try to do them like do one like that one but if you put them all down just very gently all together then you can slide them all in so they all fit in together and that's how a novel has to work it just all has to gently all come together at the right time and that means being quite patient and waiting for other stuff to work itself out well not only do we get writing advice here we're getting furniture advice flat i mean this advice. is yeah doing a lot of um <laughs> yeah flat boxing Harriet, we come to the final question on the podcast, which is, as ever, the most crucial one. So please prepare yourself. And it is, what biscuit powered the writing of The Stargazers? What was your biscuit of choice? Ginger nuts, Philippa. Next question. (laughs) Yeah, I'm obsessed with ginger nuts. I like, I have quite a sweet tooth, especially after I had children. People bring you a lot of sweet things and I didn't used to have a sweet tooth. And actually, I will eat biscuits all day. And you, you'll know, like, if you work from home, when the pandemic started, I was like, listen, guys, you're all, like, just stay away from the biscuits. I've worked at home for the last 10 years and it's bad. Ginger nuts are really good because there's something about ginger nut is just enough. It's just, it's not too sweet. It's not, if you have two, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's, it's the perfect biscuit. And ginger is healthy, really, in my eyes. Essentially, it's a health food. So that's fine for me to eat multiple ginger nuts. Yes. Your body is just saying thank you for for being so healthy. Thank you, you, Harry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's just wonderful to talk to you and hear more about the stargazers. Harriet Evans, thank you so much. Thank you. So there we go. Those are your two interviews, but I've got some more book reviews. Let me tell you all about them. So next is the book, which is called A Spoonful of Murder by J.M. Hall. And this is the blurb on this one. Every Thursday, three retired school teachers have their coffee o'clock sessions at the Thirsk Garden Centre Cafe. But one fateful week, as they're catching up with a slice of cake, they bump into their ex-colleague Topsy. By next Thursday, Topsy's dead. The last thing Liz, Thelma and Pat imagined was that they would become involved in a murder but they know there's more to Topsy's death than meets the eye and it's down to them to prove it. So what did I think about this book? I enjoyed it. It's very, it's an easy read. It's cosy crime. Yes, it's bizarre that it's also a Thursday murder club, but there we are. Um, But I would say it's quite different to the Richard Osman series, so you can read both and enjoy them for different reasons. Um, It's As I say, it's light, but there was a good story running through it. And yes, I I kept reading it. So that was A Spoonful of Murder by J.M. Hall. And next we come to Spy Family. And this is a manga series. Get me being cool. And this is the fifth book in that series. And it's Spy Family by Tatsuya Endo. I really enjoy these so much. I do feel that you don't get much story each time. So if you're interested in reading it, It might be worth getting, if you can get hold of a volume that includes a number of the different books, you might get more out of it. But I do really enjoy it. I'm always keen to find out what happens next. I definitely want to read the next one. I'm really glad I started this series. So yes, very, very good. And now we come to the last book, Shatter Me by Tahara Mafi. Now, I listened to this on audiobook. And I think that was the problem because someone recently told me that with Waze, which is a sat-nav system, sorry, I know I'm going off at tangent, bear with. So with Waze, you can choose lots of different voices. And the voice I'd had on last week was a unicorn, which is lots of fun. Having a unicorn guide you, they are brilliant, I have to say. Anyway, so having had this unicorn guide me, and then I started listening to the audiobook of Shatter Me, and I really struggled with it. And I kept thinking, why am I struggling with it? And then I realised, oh my goodness, it's the unicorn voice. It It is, I don't know if it is the same person. 
but it sounds very much like my unicorn sat nav. So I did struggle with this and I had to listen to it on a very fast speed to get through it. So, and it's a shame because this is the first of a series. It's sort of YA dystopian and I was really looking forward to getting into it. So a bit sad about that. But anyway, let me read you the blurb. And I should say this is just me. And, I, you know, this book is loved by so many people. So please form your own judgment on this one. Here we go. So the blurb is this. A fragile teenage girl is held captive, locked in a cell by the re-establishment, a harsh dictatorship in charge of a crumbling world. But Juliet is no ordinary teenager. One touch from her can kill. The re-establishment wants to use her as a weapon, but Juliet has other plans. After a lifetime without freedom, she's finally discovered the strength to fight back and to find a future with the one person she thought she'd lost forever. <sighs> I'd, it, there are some spicy bits that I didn't enjoy listening to. I don't know. Maybe it's hearing someone that you thought was a unicorn read some spicy scenes. That, that, that was quite troubling. Maybe if I just read the book, I would have really enjoyed it. Who knows? Because I'm not reading it and I'm not reading any more in this series. I really did not enjoy it, which I'm really sorry about. As I say, that is entirely me. I'm sure it's because of the unicorn impact. And I don't think anybody else who listens to the, the audio ver book version would have had a unicorn directing their sat nav in the week preceding that. So I think that problem is entirely of my own doing. Please read the book. Please tell me what you think. I could do with getting other views on this because, this, as I say, it's loved by so many people. It's a really popular series. Anyway, I've waffled. I've done. There are some great books this week. I shouldn't take airtime up with the books that I didn't enjoy. There's some brilliant books. And let's just have a recap. So we've had The Armour of Light by Ken Follett. And Ken, very kindly, has joined us on the episode today. We've had The Stargazers by Harriet Evans. And Harriet, very kindly, joined us as well. We've also had A Spoonful of Murder by J.M. Hall the fifth in the series of Spy Family and Shatter Me by Tahara Mafi. Those are your books. I'm sending you on your way. Just look after yourselves. Always choose unicorns for sat-navs and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon. <laughs>